you adjust the frequency and volume a bit? Volume a bit? Startups, originators, musica, cultura, the arts, politica, sports, news, technology, crime, tragedy, comedy, lahat ng makabuluhan. We are your independent podcast content creator, straight from the Philippine Islands. Mabuhay. You're listening to podcast.ph. Welcome to the 48th episode of Martin's Man Cave here on podcast.ph. My name is Martin Andonar. You can listen to us through soundcloud.com. Just type in podcast.ph on SoundCloud. You can also listen and download us for free on iTunes. Just type podcast.ph programs or you can go straight to our website, which is podcast.ph. Follow and like us on uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or Google+. Plus. Again, just type podcast.ph, and we can converse socially. Today, our guest is a person who is, who is representing uh, an institution, here in the country, we have Greg Yan, the communications head of WWF. Welcome to podcast.ph and you're inside Martin's Man Cave. Greg, thank you so much for saying yes to my invitation to come over. Thanks a lot, Martin. It's a huge honor to be in your man cave. And I've been to many man caves. This is the manliest of all man caves that I've ever been to. It beats the bat cave actually <laughs> thank you so much uh, we we try to make a guests uh, comfortable and at least you know so that they can speak more about maybe their lives and in your case talk about the institution wwf can you tell us or let's begin with how it all started here in the philippines wwf all right so our story begins in 1960 mm -hmm when a group of eminent British biologists went on a fact-finding mission mm -hmm. funded by UNESCO to East Africa. And there they saw and realized that the plight of many of the world's endangered animals was very, very precarious. So guys down in Africa were shooting not just themselves, but endangered animals like rhinos and elephants for their horns and tusks. Mm -hmm. The first batch of the creators of WWF flew back to England and there they wrote a series of articles for the London Observer, which was the number one Sunday newspaper at the time. Mm -hmm. And so inspiring were these articles that they gave birth to the world's first conservation organization, which was then known as the World Wildlife Fund. Mm -hmm. So it was initially conceived as an organization to be able to fund concrete projects. Uh, the projects were very small when we started out. Let's say a hundred dollars so Mr. Ching or whatever could breed wild asses <laughs> in Asia. <laughs> true, okay, true. Right. <laughs> we actually had a project like that. And then eventually they became broader and broader in scope. Mm -hmm. We started conserving more iconic species like mountain gorillas mm -hmm. and then rhinos and elephants and then tigers. In 1986, WWF grew from just being the World Wildlife Fund into the Worldwide Fund for Nature when the creators realized, hey, there's more to this than just saving wildlife. We can save every giraffe in the world and every hippo or every elephant but if we don't look at more systemic solutions to problems uh, these are overpopulation, overconsumption of resources, warfare, mm -hmm. climate change, then we are going to lose everything. So after 1986, we became known as the World Wide Fund for Nature to show how the work has dramatically expanded and the World Wide Fund for Nature came to the Philippines as early as 1969. Uh, back then, there was a complicated government-to-government -government deal called the Debt for Nature swap. So if you had a debt 
you could erase it by uh, spearheading conservation projects. So we did too back in 1969 mm -hmm. for the tamarang and the Philippine eagle, which indirectly gave rise to two other very good organizations, the Philippine Eagle Foundation and the Tamarang Conservation Program. Mm -hmm. But WWF Philippines was really born in 1996 and 1997 as one of the national organizations of the 100 strong WWF global network. So the network is active in about 100 plus countries globally from Argentina to mm -hmm. Zimbabwe. And we're supported by 5 million people globally plus another two or so million in the United States. Mm -hmm. So it's the largest, oldest, and probably the most influential of the conservation organizations working now mm -hmm. on this planet. So that's why WWF is not just about the animals and conserving or preserving and making the Philippine Eagle uh, multiply yeah. now we're talking about uh, Earth Hour which is a, a week ago kaya pala ganun ano kasi when you say WWF usually the top of mind is World Wildlife or World Wrestling Federation <laughs> World Wrestling Federation <laughs> we actually them. sued the World Wrestling <laughs> Federation forcing them to change the name to oh, World really? Wrestling Entertainment oh wow that's something new yeah so, yeah the, that's well, the I'm, real story that's the, the no wonder they changed to the WWE. Yeah, yeah. Yung so, pala yun, no? Yeah, yun yung story. Nun. So, between oh. Hulk Hogan and Chi Chi, which is the name of the panda, uh -huh. the panda logo, uh -huh. Chi Chi wins out. Uh -huh. you know, Hulk Hogan's t shirt explosions. No good against mm. Chi Chi's oh. panda moves. I, I, I didn't know that was the reason. Uh, at least I learned something new today. You know? <laughs> so, the reason why WWF or World Wrestling Federation changed into. WWE, it's because of you guys. So from animals to a holistic solution to solve the systemic problem of the world and uh, turn the vicious cycle into vir virtuous. Um, in the Philippines, let me go back. How did the Saving the Tamaraos and the Philippine Eagle project of WWF go? All right. So these were debt for nature swaps. Mm -hmm. So we help facilitate these debts for nature. Mm -hmm. And now they're actually moving independently of mm -hmm. WWF. Mm -hmm. So about 40 years later. But ever since about three years ago, three years ago, mm -hmm. we went back to our roots and decided to take a more active part in conserving the Tamarao once more. Mm -hmm. The government's Tamarao Conservation Program, totally awesome guys, super dedicated. Uh -huh. These guys have nothing but homemade shotguns, literally made out of, they call them pugakang. Uh -huh. uh, these are like homemade paltik weapons. And they, they go up against poachers armed with like M16s really? and M14s and these guys who hunt tamarau and deer. Mm. Where is this normally uh, seen? Uh, the the tamaraus. Where where, oh. where where can one uh, go out and, and uh, check the tamaraus out in the country? All right. So a long time ago, they could be found both in the island of Mindoro and in mainland Luzon. Mm -hmm. We've actually had some excavations which proves mm -hmm. that we once had Tamarao in Luzon. But <clears throat> up to about 100 years ago, there were still up to 10,000 Tamarao. And the Tamarao is a dwarf buffalo species that is found nowhere else on Earth. Just here? Just here in the Philippines. Uh, it is the smallest of the wild buffalo. Uh -huh. And you can differentiate a Tamarao from a Carabao because a Tamarao is smaller, a bit longer, bit hairier mm. they've got v-shaped horns mm -hmm. whereas a carabao would have c-shaped horns and they are fierce as anything i've seen them out in the wild mm -hmm. uh, i was i was uh fortunate enough to have uh been on a research expedition to document mm -hmm. the tamara and they don't move like 
Carabao. They move like deer. Oh, they move fast. They move fast. They even jump. Wow. So that's crazy. And then what happened was, back in the 1930s, some very enterprising cattle ranchers brought some cattle mm-hmm. up to their main enclave, which is the Iglit Bako mountain range in Occidental Mindoro. Mm-hmm. And they introduced something called Rinder Pest, which is an absolutely horrible disease for cattle or buffalo. So from cattle, the disease spread to the Tamarau oh. and nearly wiped them out such that by 1969, around the time that the debt for nature swap was being facilitated, there were less than 100 tamaraus My goodness. in the whole wide world. So um, it was one of the most endangered animals on earth at yeah. the time. So we, mm. we, with the help of the IUCN, we classified them as a critically endangered, mm-hmm. which is a step above extinction. Mm-hmm. And the Tamara Conservation Program has been working to save them since 1979. Mm-hmm. And WWF came in in 2012 mm-hmm. again, this time with FEU. So FEU Tamaraos. Oh, right. Mm-hmm. And our good friends from the local government, of Mindoro, and even the tribesmen that live there, the Tao Buid Mangyan. And since 2012, we have done a lot of good work. Mm-hmm. When we started counting Tamarau three years ago, there mm-hmm. were 327 of them. Oh. Just from from less than 100 to 327. It's been increasing. It's been increasing. Then the year after that, we hit 345. And last April, April 2014, we hit 382. So this is the highest number ever recorded for Tamarau since nice. the counts began mm-hmm. maybe 15 years ago. So we can see that increased enforcement. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the guys with the homemade rifles. Th- these guys can be found in Mindoro. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Right now, as mm-hmm. you're listening to this, mm-hmm. there are very dedicated park rangers mm-hmm. protecting our Tamarau. Mm-hmm. And the other part, aside from enforcement, would be strong education. Mm-hmm. So sometimes people just don't know that it's illegal to hunt Tamarau. Mm-hmm. Or they should be made aware of the massive legal penalties mm-hmm. that they will incur if they shoot down Tamara. But every now and then, these crazy guys yeah. sneak into the park and, you know, take down a Tamara and maybe two deer or some wild boar and mm. they slink out. But, you know, the government and WWF and even the tribesmen that live there are doing all we can to mm-hmm. make sure that the Tamara recovers. The Tamarau project, as it is successful, is it uh, as successful as the Philippine Eagle? Uh, the Philippine Eagle conservation drive is being spearheaded by another very good foundation called PEF, or the Philippine mm-hmm. Eagle Foundation. Mm-hmm. We're also in close ties mm-hmm. with them, but they're doing a lot of good work. Mm-hmm. Except that Philippine Eagles in my mind are a bit harder to conserve than Tamara because you mm-hmm. protect them inside a the park. Mm-hmm. They fly out. Yes. Yeah, so. They get shot down by some <laughs> crazy hunter. So there are a lot of crazy hunters put in uh, Davao or in uh, some parts of Mindanao? In oh. many parts of Mindanao. Mindanao, Mindanao yeah. It's similar to to the story, the origin story of WWF. Yeah. Where uh, uh, wars affect not just human life but also wild life. Mm-hmm. So there, but Tamara Tamara work is uh, really super exciting. I remember I mm-hmm. we went down there back in 2012. I think it was September 2012, and man, I went down there with a ghillie suit, like a like a like a sniper's ghillie suit, and this thing just weighed like mm. 10 pounds. Mm-hmm. When it got wet, it weighed like 15 pounds, and it smelled like crap because the the trackers told me. The Tamarau doesn't have really good eyesight, mm-hmm. but it has excellent sense of hearing and hearing. a great sense of smell. Yes. Yeah, so no cologne, no soap, 
nothing. But I was rubbing mud all over this ghillie suit. Uh-huh. And after a while, it just smelled like mud and crap. Uh-huh. <laughs> but then it was funny because uh, I was wearing this ghillie suit up and down the mountain. But then I was fooling no one. Because yeah. every Tamara within 200 meters was looking at me. Mm-hmm. Or at least looking at the sound of the clumsy guy mm-hmm. rustling around the, mm-hmm. the hillside. So, it's a pretty interesting experience. Apart from these endangered animals, the, the tamarau and the, and the Philippine eagle, are there other endangered species that um, WWF Nature is um, into right now? Sure, mm-hmm. sure. Mm-hmm. There are so many endangered species here because as much as the Philippines is a biodiversity hotspot, uh-huh. It's also a hot spot for extinction. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I recently wrote an article on Rappler about how the country once had elephants and rhinos and giant tortoises. And this has been stock knowledge to many people who, who are really into conservation, but so few Filipinos are aware of this. We had elephants here. Yeah, we had ele- we had three kinds of elephants in, in the, the Philippines. Philippines and yeah. rhinos. We had rhinos in the Philippines, but oh. we hunted them out a long time ago. Get this: we had tigers, tigers in Palawan. Too. Talaga. As in pantera tigris. As in uh, these are local. Yeah, local tigers. The elephants are an interesting story. Um, we once had uh, elephants are part of a very large order of animals with about 200 discovered members. We think of elephants. We only think of the Asian and the African elephant right now because those are the only two left. Well, there's a third kind, African bush elephant. But there were once 200 of them. Uh, Mastodons and mammoths and stegodons. We had stegodons, which look like elephants, up in the Cagayan Valley. In Iloilo, we had them too. But up to about 4,000 years ago, they died out. Mm-hmm. So extinction, it's a natural phenomenon. But oh. what's really scary is the rate by which animals are becoming extinct. Mm-hmm. So it's several hundred times faster than the normal rate. There are okay. many kinds of tarsiers uh-huh. uh, up and down Asia. Mm-hmm. We have Tarsius sirikta here. And you find them not just in Bohol, mm-hmm. but in many parts of Mindanao. Mm-hmm. Uh, unfortunately, they are threatened by poaching. Uh-huh. And by logging. Now, logging has always been a, mm-hmm. a big problem for the Philippines. Mm-hmm. Up to 300 years ago, if you flew mm-hmm. over the Philippines in a, in a spaceship, if you went back in time, mm-hmm. you would see an archipelago covered nearly end-to-end with rainforest. Philippines. Yeah, yeah. well, there were some rainforest, human communities though. near yeah, rivers and coasts. Mm-hmm. But we were a, an archipelago of beautiful trees mm-hmm. and when Spaniards came in they realized oh we can turn these trees into galleons that's exactly what they did at the, the whole galleon trade many of those ships were built using Philippine timber mm-hmm. and it takes thousands of big trees just to launch one caravel or a galleon or a brigand or a, any of those ships and we uh, systemically have been deforesting this country so much that X percent, the figures vary widely, mm-hmm. but maybe up to 10% is left. Uh, only 10% is left. Yeah, I had a chance, I had a chance to, to uh, tour the rainforest in Davao, and wow, I saw, I saw it from above, and I could see that uh, well, huge trees, and I guess the, the mayor there is uh, feared for <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is feared um, and all of the illegal loggers would stay away from it but then again it's, they've done a fantastic job on conserving at least and preserving the forest the forested area there where the Philippine eagle or eagles are supposed to uh, reside right now no? and then so we were riding a chopper and there was this like a few huge trees and there were bats all over oh, wow. bats and then and the pilot was crazy enough to say let's just let's just go down a bit 
And then we went down and all the bats just flew. And, and then, uh, you know, what do you see on the National Geographic, all of these uh, channels that, that's, that, that, uh, that show these um, nature-driven uh, films, you know. Kaleng, you'd see the bats go like that, and then, oh my goodness, you can always see that. You, you 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 can only almost see this in movies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was, uh, and you were telling me that uh, from end to end of the Philippines, rainforest, and I could just imagine it looked like that from A long time from from north to south. No. Yeah, yeah. You know, the world's mm. largest bat is also endangered. Mm. Can be found here. It's probably what you saw. Mm-hmm. Uh, the golden crown flying fox. Oh, that's And so it's as big as a mananangal. Talaga. And many people think that the mananangal origin story started out from from these giant uh-huh. bats. Baka yun yun. Because, Baka yun yun. Yeah, because you know, you know, from above, they, they look, well, I could see them from above. <laughs> so, I mean, if you go near, they'd be huge. It's huge. The wingspans, I think, are like four, four. Five so yun yung malananggal no? <laughs> yeah yun yung origin story ng malananggal yeah, parang dugong mm. uh, that's the origin story for mm. the mermaids mm. right mm. so if you're out at sea long enough you get desperate enough in your brain mm. you see anything that looks like a woman mm-hmm. oh yeah it's a mermaid ano yan dugong dugong sea cows but, uh, ap- ap- apart from from the eagle the uh we did mention the tarsier and um, the tamaraos. How about at sea? Yeah. Uh, ano yung mga endangered species natin? All right. So, the Philippines is lucky enough to form the apex of what is called the coral triangle. Mm-hmm. This triangle, which encompasses, of course, the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei, ah, sorry, the Solomon Islands, Timor Leste. And well, there that's the coral triangle area, which includes Papua New Guinea, harbors about 500 different species of reef building coral, but it also has the highest levels of marine diversity on Earth. Mm-hmm. So it's even higher than the Great Barrier Reef. Although GBR is excellent and it's huge, uh, in terms of per square kilometer density and variety of life, the coral triangle is really where it's at. Here you find some of the most beautiful, charismatic, but endangered creatures, including, of course, the dugong. Mm-hmm. And then we have such charismatic animals as whales and dolphins mm-hmm. and the whale shark, which is another mm-hmm. creature that WWF conserves. In fact, the story of the whale shark is a textbook story on how conservation can make people's lives better. Mm-hmm. So... The story begins in 1997 and 1998 mm-hmm. when a diver, Dave Duran, he went down to Donsol. He discovered, oh, he realized that many fishermen were familiar with a very friendly large shark. Many of these sharks were going around, just bump ramming into fishing nets. And he realized, oh, these are whale sharks. Around this time, the best whale shark interaction package was being offered in Australia in Ningalu Reef but over there you would have to pay like 350 US dollars mm. you, you'd have to hire a spotter plane just so that it can look for whale sharks so your boat can go there and you can interact with them but Tunsol was a bay in Sorsogon in the Philippines where there were hundreds of these whale sharks just within a kilometer from shore and so whale sharks were still being killed in horrific ways before 1998. Mm-hmm. There's an island in Bohol called Pamilakan and I love I love the people there but they, they've been hunting whales, whale sharks, dolphins for the longest time. They got its name from Pamilak which is a, like a, a handheld gaff which they use to manually gaff a live whale shark, mm-hmm. tow it to shore, My goodness. chop it up for meat and fins while it's still alive. While it's still alive, I've seen the footages, really. The, the sea would run red. Uh, we came in, WWF came in around 1998 and helped make the whale shark one of the few legally protected fish species in the country. So in place of hunting, 
there became an ecotourism program in Donsol. Although the Donsolanos were never really hunters of whale mm-hmm. sharks, mm-hmm. they became stewards. And we put in place a program wherein people can go on a boat and skin dive with these whale sharks for a very affordable fee. And by the year 2004, it was cited by Time Magazine as the best animal encounter in Asia. So fast forward to now, 2015, whale shark interactions, they're one of the best tourist draws in the entire Bicol region. And 25,000 people flock to Dunsol every summer just to swim with the whale sharks. Money has flowed into Dunsol because of the simple decision to protect and not slaughter whale sharks. So that from 1998, it was still a fifth-class municipality. It was earning 10 million and below per year. Mm -hmm. And now it is a Mm first-class municipality, Mm -hmm. home to restaurants, good roads, good lighting, and a new generation of children who got high school and college educations because of the ecotourism program. Mm -hmm. So... What happened to that island in Bohol where you came in and gave them some seminars and taught them the, the value of these whale sharks? Well, let's put it this way. Which of the two areas became a first-class municipality? So, so, Mila, yeah, 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 or yeah. Donsol? Donsol. Donsol. So they kept, they, they, kept, they, they kept on slaughtering oh, whale sharks. Oh, they stopped slaughtering the whale sharks, but the last time I was down there... They were still slaughtering manta rays, which is also illegal. Uh And I love the people from there, but let's call a spade a spade. And if you're doing a legal act, Mm -hmm. we've got to call you out on it because we are the WWF. And Mm -hmm. if we don't call you out on it, who else will? Mm -hmm. So we've got to put a stop on the hunting of legally protected creatures like Mm -hmm. treasure sharks and manta rays. Whale sharks, dolphins, and whales, mm-hmm. sea turtles, mm-hmm. dugongs, and many other creatures. My goodness. Wow. wow. DNR is supposed to be the agency? Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, DNR that's... and the Bureau of Fisheries. Bureau of Fisheries. DFAR, and they are very good allies of WWF. They're, they're doing just, all they can. They're just undermanned. They are undermanned. I mean... We've got 36,000 square, uh, 36,000 kilometers of coast and 27,000 square kilometers Mm -hmm. of coral reefs alone. So to police Mm. all of these Mm. places 24-7, man, that's going to require like superhero powers. (laughs) Be like Iron Man or something. So Mm -hmm. only through vigilance Mm -hmm. and the power of social media Mm -hmm. and even cell phones can we make sure that perpetrators are identified and punished to the full extent of the law. We must make examples so that they'll realize, hey, we mean business. Yes. Uh, no more illegal anything. Yeah, you mentioned earlier that there are certain places in the Philippines where you can also find tarsiers ap- apart from Bohol. And my uncle from Shargao told me that uh, the forest area of Shargao has tarsiers, so maybe it's a different type of tarsier, but definitely it has big eyes and <laughs> it's got big eyes. <laughs> and they roam the trees of, of, of the mountains of Shargao. Let's talk about uh, nature. What are the projects that you have under WWF Nature? All right, so we have numerous initiatives in about 15 project sites throughout the country from Ilocos Norte up to Tawi Tawi. WWF has project sites, but there are larger initiatives which aren't confined to specific provinces. Uh, We have an environmental life skills program which goes around the country to teach children on ways to reduce their carbon footprint or on how to take care of coastal resources. Mm -hmm. And we have a very extensive climate change program. Uh, The most popular project of this program would be Earth Hour, which we did a great podcast mm-hmm. on it not too long ago. Yes. And Earth Hour is really one of the 
most successful initiatives, not just of WWF Philippines, but of the entire WWF global network. In fact, we've had more countries celebrating Earth Hour than there are WWF offices globally. Mm -hmm. So it's really spread like wildfire. Mm -hmm. But in terms of climate change, we have so many initiatives, and one of these is called Caesar Power. Now, Caesar Power is a global WWF movement to convince governments and private sector investors mm -hmm. to put in their funds with renewable energy mm -hmm. projects. So we want literally billions and billions of pesos to be shifted away from being invested into dirty fossil fuels like coal and oil mm -hmm. and to be reallocated to renewable energy projects. Mm -hmm. One sub-campaign is called Seize the Wind, which we're doing in the Philippines for this period. And it's all about enhancing support for wind farms in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And already we're seeing more and more totally awesome looking wind farms. There's one in Pililla, Rizal. Mm -hmm. And if you go to Ilocos Norte and Ilocos Sur, you will be able to see three huge wind farms. There is the famous Bangui wind farm uh, in Bangui by the, by the bay near a, a lighthouse. And then you have the new Burgos wind farm, 50 wind turbines. It's crazy. I've been there. I felt like, like Don Quixote. All you need is like a horse and yeah. jousted with a bunch of windmills. And it's really, uh, it looks like the hills are alive. You know, it looks like the sound of music because uh -huh. there are windmills. It's pretty windy, duh. Mm -hmm. And the, it, the region is mountainous and full of nice green grass. The last mm -hmm. one is in Pagudpud. There is a, I think it's a, is it a Lopez group mm -hmm. holding? Yeah. So more and more wind farms are sprouting up and the country is really poised to become the wind energy leader in Southeast Asia. And mm -hmm. this is perfect because renewable energy is clean. We don't add any more carbon emissions to the atmosphere, which is the primary cause of anthropogenic or man-made climate change. It's economical in the long run because we don't have to import expensive coal or oil from other nations which have us by the neck or since this is the man cave, got us by the balls. <laughs> you know, if they dictate yeah. any price, we don't have a choice because if we don't buy the crazy coal from them, we're, yeah. we're going to have a blackout, right? Yes. So, but by going with indigenous <laughs> renewable energy options, we dictate how much power we can give to our fellow Filipinos. Are there any wind farms in Mindanao or... Um, in Visayas? In the Visayas. There's one. There's in, one? Uh -huh. Yeah, there's a Trans-Asia uh -huh. wind farm in Guimaras. These farms are owned by private companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By private by, uh, companies. Does it mean that the electricity produced by these wind farms um, is more expensive than the coal-powered ones or the diesel-powered power plants? Oh, that's a, The long and short answer is in the long run, no. Mm -hmm. It's going to be cheaper yes. because there is something called a feed-in mm -hmm. tariff. Mm -hmm. So a fit rate. Uh, make sure that the price of power which mm -hmm. you buy from these sources, which are allotted FITs, mm -hmm. are more or less held constant. I believe it's a period of like 20 years. Mm -hmm. So if RE is constant for 20 years, coal or oil will definitely not be constant. Sometimes mm -hmm. the price of fuel drops. Right now, it's relatively low. Mm -hmm. But I'm telling you, it's going to shoot up again like again. anything. Because it's, like, it's super volatile. It's like sunrise and sunset. Mm -hmm. It's always like that. It's, <laughs> it's always, always like that. It, it, always, it, it always happens. Now, what is the advantage or what are the advantages of, the wind, of wind farms to solar? To solar. <laughs> well... <clears throat> Every region will ideally be powered by a mix of renewable energy options. Mm -hmm. It's not just, oh, this place is just mm -hmm. solar forever. Mm -hmm. This place, geothermal forever. Mm -hmm. Well, ideally, we'd want 
geothermal plants, which are tried and tested ways of generating energy. Back in the 1970s, the Philippines invested heavily in geothermal energy. I mean, you gotta hand it to Marcos. Mm -hmm. He thought about this back in the 70s, and we are reaping the benefits from our investment in geothermal power. We are the second largest generator of geothermal energy next to the United States. Oh, wow. I mean, in the world, we are the My second. My goodness, I didn't know that. Yeah. Geothermal energy is one of the few things keeping prices of power down here. Really? Yeah, and already, we have expensive So if power. we have geothermal, the only geothermal plant I know is the one in Visayas, the one in Samar. Is that Samar or Leyte? Uh, they're all around the country. Really? Yeah, the Philippines has 27 active volcanoes. Just put a geothermal plant near an active volcano. Uh -oh. You will get unlimited power! <laughs> As the emperor said. <laughs> it's unlimited power. But uh, how come... How come the government doesn't talk about it that much? Geothermal? It, it doesn't. It doesn't. Well, they say that they have geothermal power, but they don't. They don't uh, promote it as much as I mean Napocor, right? It, it doesn't promote geothermal power as it's supposed to. Right now, I'm hearing it from you that we have a lot of active volcanoes, and you just put one on top of it, and there you go. You have you have uh, renewable energy. That's true. That's mm. true. Um, I guess they have a lot on their plate. The Department of Energy are mm -hmm. also good friends of WWF. Um, but sometimes if you're faced with a crisis, and we do have a crisis in power right now, uh, man, you are presented with lots of solutions. Some of these are short-term, some are long-term. And the short-term solutions are coal plants. We, oh man, we... We were crazy enough to invest in a lot of coal plants, especially during the the power crisis of the the 1990s. Remember the, the time of Ramos? Yeah, the, the, the time, time of Ramos. Ramos. The independent power uh, suppliers, right? Yeah, yeah, and it it solved the problem immediately, but we are paying for that now because we've got too many coal plants, and more coal plants are set to be built. But mm -hmm. if you look at if you look at the coal plant. And let's say a wind farm side by side. Wind farm is the way to go. Every way, every which way. Because um, aside from the obvious benefits of wind farms being cleaner, being safer, no need to burn volatile substances, wind farms are super fast to put up. It takes maybe a year, a full year for a wind par farm to be erected. <laughs> If I can say erected on the show, <laughs> you're in the man cave. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if, okay. Yeah, erected. <laughs> and uh, a coal plant, you know, it takes like two, three, four <laughs> years. So it's even better. But it's okay. faster, pala, no? It's faster. But sometimes there's no wind. Sometimes right? when the wind doesn't blow, then you have geothermal. You have geothermal, or you put solar panels in between oh. the turbines, which is what they're already doing in. So Burgos. does it mean that? The these places where the wind farms are, or where the geothermal power plants are, uh, these places have ample supply of <laughs> electricity. Yep, yep. Uh, you only ever put a wind farm in areas identified as having lots of wind, and I mean so much wind that mm. when I went to Bangui and I thought, oh, sure, we can surf here. Mm. Uh, sure, it's probably a surf spot. The waves are too violent. Oh yeah, you can't. That you can't even surf. You can't stand up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, unless you're like a pro surfer. But mm. so there are two solutions to our power crisis. One is to go with RE and the other, which our listeners can very easily mm -hmm. um, adopt, would be energy efficiency. So every two years, WWF comes out with a global study called the Living Planet Report, which juxtaposes, and I just wanted to use the word juxtapose because... Mm. I only get to use it like three times a year. <laughs> <laughs> the other word that I always want to use is um, scrumptious. Scrumptious. Yeah, okay. food. Uh -huh. Scrumptious. And juxtapose. <laughs> juxtapose. So the, just juxtapose the scrumptious food. The <laughs> scrumptious food. <laughs> uh, experience. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it juxtaposes the planet's ability to provide us with the resources that humans use. Mm -hmm. It's food, water, energy, clean water. Um, with our actual usage of these 
resources. Mm. And so, we're seeing a 33% overshoot. Meaning, and my boss, the president of WF, always says this, Mr. Palma, we have only one planet, yet we are consuming at the rate of 1.5 planets using the ways by which we live our lives now. Mm -hmm. So the solution to get it back to one or even less is through energy efficiency mm -hmm. and water efficiency and food efficiency. And of course, it's been done to death, but I'm going to have to say this. So guys, please switch from energy wasteful incandescent bulbs to CFLs. Oh no, not that one. <laughs> no, 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 that's cool, that's cool. Two LEDs, which LEDs, are yeah. currently the most energy efficient technology we have at the moment, but in a hundred years, mm. we're probably going to have like a super energy efficient light about, source. About, uh, don't worry, about, about 90, 98% of the lights in the house are LEDs. Are LEDs. It's just that for the... For the effect of the man cave. <laughs> <laughs> like a torch. I yes, see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well there. Oh there, yeah. Oh uh, there. We've got we've got nice lights. Okay, but yeah. here's a here's a new thing. There are LEDs which are now tinged yellow for the, the warm torch one. look. Yeah, the warm, warm LEDs. Yeah, yeah. the warm LEDs. Yeah. I've uh, got that on the other studio. Yeah, I saw, I saw. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> yeah. And it's not just LEDs. Appliances, television sets, refrigerators, mm -hmm. air conditioners mm -hmm. can all be Energy Star appliances. Mm -hmm. And of course, you get to save planet Earth mm -hmm. and you get to save moolah. A lot. Which is always a, a plus yes. in the Philippines. Now, a lot of our listeners may be in Visayas, Mindanao and a lot of them may have their own influence and power in their own municipalities and they'd probably want to work with WWF Nature Philippines. Where do they go? Who do they contact you? Uh, well, mm. yeah, yeah, sure. You can contact me. Just find me on Facebook. It's mm. Greg Yan. It's G-R-E-G-G -G, space Y-A-N. Mm -hmm. Or you can check out our website at www.wwf.org.ph mm -hmm. we have a facebook mm -hmm. fan page www.philippines a twitter and instagram mm -hmm. um, account mm -hmm. so just wwf philippines mm -hmm. or you can also email us at kkp mm -hmm. at www.org.ph mm -hmm. and we will get back to you as fast as Anything. Before you can say mm. Martin's man cave is awesome. <laughs> oh, we got a we got an email right now. Okay, that was pretty fast. Yeah. Okay. So they'll also, uh, if they want to donate, it's the same website. Just go there and. Yeah, yeah. Although, mm. uh, we have a special project mm -hmm. called the Gift of Light. Mm -hmm. This is an offshoot of Earth Hour, and it's part of our climate change program. So we wanted to champion renewable energy and energy efficiency mm -hmm. by deploying hundreds of portable solar lamps in various communities around the nation. One would be in the northern island of Beton. Actually, the name is Ikandambua Island, but everyone just calls it Beton oh. Island. And we want to give fisher folk families and children the solar lamp so that they can work at night and more importantly study at night that they may realize the value of education and how it can lift them out of poverty so for our listeners please please help us give the gift of light to communities in Palawan by making a donation at wwf.org.ph slash earth hour or just go to the main global website of Earth Hour, earthhour.org, and look for the Gift of Light. There are many projects featured mm -hmm. from all around the world, mm -hmm. but support your own. Siyempre, Pilipino po tayo. Of course, kaya no. Kailangan tulungan natin ang mga kapwa Pilipino yeah. natin sa Palawan. Maraming problema sa Pilipinas alone. So, Marami. Una, una, <laughs> Marami rin yung solution. Marami, marami rin silang problema. <laughs> dito muna tayo sa problema natin. Ah, dito muna. Tulungan muna natin mga kababayan natin. Any other 
uh, events in the in the coming weeks or coming months that you have that you'd like to promote here in the podcast? Uh, sure. Uh, well, we just finished Earth Hour. Earth Hour 2016 mm -hmm. is slated for March the 26th, I think. Mm -hmm. I think it's Black Saturday 2016. So hopefully we get to sit down with you again in your uh -huh. man cave to talk about it with a new project. Mm -hmm. And the next big event we have is Coral Triangle Day, which will be on June 9, 2016. Mm -hmm. So we're going to celebrate the beauty and the value of the Coral Triangle in giving food and livelihood and awesome dive spots. Mm -hmm. Not just in the Philippines, but throughout the entire Coral Triangle region. Mm -hmm. And for more updates on upcoming events, just log on to our Facebook fan page and we post everything there from stories to volunteerships. Mm -hmm. If you guys want to help out or dive with whale sharks or count Tamara in the middle of nowhere wearing a smelly mud looking <laughs> ghillie suit, you can just check us out at the Facebook fan page. So we're always at your service. Yeah. And meet new friends too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. While you're at it. Thank you so much, Greg. Maybe you'd you'd uh, probably consider having a podcast here on podcast.ph. Talk sure, about sure. wildlife and talk about nature and uh, conservation. I'd yeah. be super honored to. Instead of me guesting you all the time, just have your own podcast here. <laughs> <laughs> no problem, no problem. Good as done. Thank you so kind much. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you so much, Greg Ann of the WWF. Ladies and gentlemen, you just heard another Martin's Man Cave episode. It's the 48th episode and uh, what makes this episode unique is that we just talked to i think the first time we talked to an an institution wwf no not just a personality but the entire institution and hopefully we'll have them on the platform podcast.ph uh, soon thank you so much for joining us again you can follow us on facebook twitter instagram and google plus type podcast.ph and if you want to download us, it's for free on iTunes. Just type podcast.ph programs. And better yet, go to our website, podcast.ph. Thank you so much. This podcast.ph presentation is supported by Martin Andenar's Homecast Studio and Audio.ph.